My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin, and my subject is the Roman economy, including the trade beyond the imperial frontiers. I have published several books on this subject. I am a member of the Council of the Classical Association in Northern Ireland. This is a speech prepared for the Ninth Celtic Conference in Classics at the University College Dublin in 2016. I divide this talk into four presentations. This is part one. The first video lecture considers the views and influence of a leading Cambridge academic named Moses Finkelstein, or Professor Moses Finley. The question is, can ideas from the Frankfurt School explain the ancient economy, Moses Finley and the ancient world? I have devised the Eastern Commercial Revenue Model to explain how I think the Roman Empire operated. I presented this evidence-based model for the Roman economy in Rome and the Distant East, published in 2010, The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean, 2014, and The Roman Empire and the Silk Routes, 2016. This model will become a framework for academic research by other scholars. This talk gathers and reviews influential academic opinions on the Roman economy and Eastern trade. It is intended to provide a resource for those requiring an overview of academic engagement with this subject. It will also provide a framework for debate into which additional opinions can be introduced. The first part of my talk considers previous academic attempts to construct a viable model for the Roman economy and the financial system that funded the empire. The focus is on Oxford Cambridge scholarship, as academics from these institutions frequently set the agenda for research and dominate the debate. One of the leading figures in this debate is the Cambridge professor, Sir Moses Finlay. At this point, it is worth identifying the key primary sources discussed in the Eastern Commercial Revenue Model. During the imperial period, the Roman regime was heavily reliant on international trade to finance its empire. Pliny the Elder, who served in the advisory council of the Emperor Vespasian, was well placed to receive information on trade revenues. He claimed that a hundred million sesterces of bullion were exported from the Roman Empire every year to pay for products from Arabia, India and China. Pliny reports. By the smallest computation, India, the Chinese and the Arabian Peninsula take 100 million sesterces from our empire every year. This is what our women and our luxuries cost us. Regarding maritime trade with India, he writes, It is an important matter since every year India drains more than 50 million sesterces from our empire and returns goods which are sold among us at a hundred times their cost. An export figure of 100 million sesterces represented about one-ninth of the finances needed to fund the state expenses of the entire Roman Empire for a year, 900 million sesterces. This situation was allowed to continue because Eastern commerce created highly lucrative revenues for the imperial government. The geographer Strabo, an associate of the Roman governor of Egypt, provides evidence for the scale of Eastern trade. While on a tour with the governor, Strabo learned that 120 Roman ships were sailing every year from Egypt to India. A merchant guidebook, called the Periplus of the Erythraean Sea, gives a full account of Roman trade voyages across the Indian Ocean. Evidence for the value of the cargoes returning from these distant trade ventures is given in the Musurus Papyrus, a legal contract stating prices assigned by government agents responsible for import tax. This document records a single Indian cargo aboard a Roman trade ship called the Hermopollon, valued at almost 9 million sesterces. A fleet of 120 Roman ships returning from India could probably have imported eastern goods worth over 1 billion sesterces every year. 1,080 million sesterces. During this period, the Romans imposed a quarter-rate import tax called the Tetarche, on all international goods crossing the imperial frontiers. The import tax paid on the Hermopollon was 2.25 million sesterces, and commerce on this scale would have raised at least 270 million sesterces for the Roman state every year. This represents almost a third of the revenues that Rome would require to maintain its empire 
sustain its prosperity and pay for the legions. This financial situation is supported by the surviving ancient evidence for Roman revenues. According to Plutarch, the total revenues of the Republican state in the mid-first century BC was 340 million sesterces per annum. When Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, he imposed tribute of about 40 million sesterces on the newly subdued territories. However, the greatest surge in imperial income came when the Emperor Augustus annexed Egypt. According to Strabo, Egypt had produced revenues of 300 million sesterces for the Ptolemaic Kingdom. By adding these figures together, the total arrived at suggests that the Roman Empire received over 680 million sesterces from its conquered territories. Additional income came from European gold mines. According to Pliny, gold mines in Roman Spain produced up to 80 million sesterces of bullion per annum during periods of peak production in the 1st century AD. An inscription from the 2nd century AD reveals how the Romans also received up to 90 million sesterces from the overland trade passing through the Syrian city of Palmyra on the frontier between Parthia and the Roman Empire. But it was Indian Ocean commerce that added the greatest total to Roman revenues. Taxes imposed on international trade passing through Egypt added a further 270 million sesterces to Egyptian revenues already worth 300 million. This would have raised the income of the Roman Empire to more than a thousand million sesterces per year. The historian Josephus was a client of the Flavian emperors and he confirms that Egypt provided annual revenues greater than 570 million sesterces for the Roman state. This evidence confirms the value of international commerce and the importance of Eastern economies such as India and China in sustaining Roman prosperity. This is the Eastern commercial revenue model presented in my books and articles on the subject. But Professor Finlay of Cambridge University favoured alternatives to the ancient evidence. Previously known as Moses Finkelstein, he had attended City College, New York, where he became heavily influenced by German academics from the Frankfurt School of Economics. He studied at the Institute for Social Research at Columbia University under the directorship of Max Horkheimer. Consequently, he encountered the techniques of critical theory and social development. He subsequently changed his name to I. Finley and received a teaching post at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Dr. Finley moved to England where he was awarded the position of Classics Lecturer at Jesus College in Cambridge. He became Professor of Ancient History and the Master of Darwin College. As a result, many of the leading classicists and ancient historians at Cambridge University were taught or influenced by Sir Moses Finley or his academic appointees. Professor Finley received a knighthood from the Queen in 1979. Professor Finley achieved widespread recognition by publishing one of the few books on the ancient economy written by a single author. His book, The Ancient Economy, published in 1973, considered Greek and Roman economies within the Mediterranean. In this influential work, Finley cautioned against the use of ancient numerical evidence, expressing the view Ancient historians are not immune from current number fetishism. They are beginning to claim quantitative proof where the evidence does not warrant it, or to misjudge the implication that may legitimately be drawn from these figures. Finley referred to ancient India only twice in the ancient economy. He did not mention the size of the Roman fleet sailing to India, and only briefly commented on the export figures provided by Pliny the Elder, explaining that. The famous passage in the Elder Pliny, giving dubious figures for the drain of Roman gold and silver to India and other eastern countries in payment for luxuries, are moral in their implication. 
Finley discussed trade beyond the Mediterranean and set constraints on further debate. He wrote in the ancient economy, To be meaningful, world market, a single economic unit, must embrace something considerably more than the exchange of some goods over long distances. Otherwise, China, Indonesia, the Malay Peninsula and India were also part of the same unit and world market. One must show the existence of interlocking behaviour and responses over wide areas, Enric Rule's enormous conglomeration of independent markets in the dominant sectors of the economy, in food and metal prices, for example, and one cannot, or at least no one has. Enric Rohl was the Baron Rohl of Ibsen in Oxfordshire and director of the Bank of England from 1968 to 1977. Finlay had effectively imposed 20th century banking criteria on an ancient process. Professor Fergus Miller, Camden Professor of Ancient History at Oxford University, responded to Finley's statements. He wrote, Certainly, if only some notion of a world market or single economic unit will allow us to attribute any importance to long-distance trade, we shall have to give up at once. The criteria suggested by Finley is hardly a reasonable requirement. Miller also criticised Finley for his anti-empirical tendency, that is a disposition to take any one item of evidence, especially archaeological evidence, demonstrating the movement of goods, and then reject it as not proving enough. By rejecting each item separately, Finley did come rather close to guaranteeing the impregnability of his main hypothesis, for no item of concrete evidence were allowed to mean much, no accumulation of unexpected or unfamiliar items of empirical evidence could ever occur. Furthermore, Miller points out that Finley did not say a great deal about the eastern trade of the Roman Empire. It is significant that the periplus of the Erythraean Sea is never referred to. Adding that, Finley states that his justification for talking of the ancient economy lies in its common cultural psychological framework, or in other words, to put it crudely, what people say in those ancient texts which happen to have survived. Miller summed up Finley's argument by stating that if one is going to reject an approach based on the accumulation and analysis of concrete items of evidence and look instead for a common cultural psychological framework, one must take seriously what the ancient sources say for what they, along with epigraphic evidence and iconography say, is our means of access to the common cultural psychological framework. But Finley wants, indeed needs, to have it both ways. This debate has implications for Pliny's figures concerning the scale of Eastern exports, as Finley had dismissed them as moral in their implication. Miller, while agreeing that moral concerns are part of the cultural psychological framework, pointed out that moralizing implications do not automatically deprive reports of all factual content. Miller concluded, there is simply no way of knowing whether Pliny's figures are dubious or not. Both passages are indeed alarmist or moralizing, but neither, in fact, mentions anything about gold or silver, each giving the alleged values in terms of sesterces. Nonetheless, we cannot simply brush them aside. However curious its concerns may seem to us, Pliny's natural history is the most intense exploration of man's relation to his physical environment in the widest sense known to us from antiquity. If he expresses concern about the cost of luxury trade with the East, then the existence of this luxury trade was known in Rome. It was not, in other words, a merely local phenomenon, and it was felt to be an issue of some importance. On Strabo, Miller again criticised Finley. 
it is easy to treat such figures as ideological projections of the sort already discussed, or as moralizing exaggerations, as they are by Moses Finley in his oft-quoted work on the ancient economy. But caution is in order. We may not wish to believe the report in Strabo's geography that at the end of the first century BC, 120 ships made the voyage to India, but even if the number is halved or quartered, documentary evidence oblige us to re-examine Pliny's figures. Miller also believed that, when reading the Musarus Papyrus, we are not in the realm of fantasy, but in the real world of the author of the Periplus. Professor Whitaker from Cambridge University considered Roman trade with India in his 2006 book, Rome and its Frontiers, The Dynamics of Empire. Whitaker was a supporter of Finlay and explained in the London Review of Books. Sir Moses Finlay has been my teacher, colleague and friend for close on 20 years, and while I am not intent on taking revenge on his behalf, I cannot claim to, to be able to write dispassionately about his work. Whitaker believed that Indo-Roman trade was a question of the stability of the luxury market where risks could have caused fluctuations and unpredictability of prices and cargoes of high value and low volume that targeted only the relatively rich must have always been in danger of saturating the market and thus causing a collapse of prices. In order to arrive at perfect general equilibrium of supply and demand, the market must have perfect information. The less information, the greater the risk, and the less rational or more speculative the choices. Moreover, he warned that there is a danger of exaggerating the size of Indian trade and therefore of the numbers of those involved. I have already referred to Strabo's observation that 120 ships a year sailed along the Red Sea coast, but we cannot trust this figure. Professor Jongman from Groningen University considered Finley's impact in a 2014 paper entitled The New Economic History of the Roman Empire, which was published in the volume Quantifying the Greco-Roman Economy and Beyond. Jongman concluded that Sir Moses Finley's cultural turn on the ancient economy has been the dominant paradigm of the last few decades, for social and cultural reasons, the ancient elite failed to develop an economic mentality and was unwilling to engage in trade and manufacturing. As a result, these sectors of the economy remained small and marginal. No system of interconnected markets developed, and thus the economy did not grow. He went on to say that, Finney's work demonstrates a widespread distaste for quantification, based on the one hand on his insistence that collecting accurate statistics was not part of the ancient economic mentality, and on the other hand, I assume, a philologist's romantic dislike for numbers. Professor Green provided an archaeological perspective in his book The Archaeology of the Roman Economy. Based on the ancient remains, he concluded, I believe that the level of economic activity revealed by archaeological research, makes the minimalist approach of historians, such as Finley, untenable. The economy does not show signs of advance or evolution, simply an intensification of everything that already existed in Greek and Roman Republican times. The intensification was perhaps a brief period of favourable climate which allowed agriculture and transport to operate with unusual effectiveness. The continued influence of Professor Moses Finley is demonstrated by a book published in 2018 by Professor Manning of Yale University. The book is called The Open Sea, The Economic Life of the Ancient Mediterranean. In this study, published by Princeton University Press, Manning refers to Finley 172 times. He explains, Moses Finley, the ancient economy, was an intellectual watershed in the treatment of the nature of the ancient economy. His model, in many circles, 
was declared the victor, but in fact it marked an end point. The modernist position has lived on, and indeed has come roaring back, despite the wishful thinking that it had died a natural death, and had been buried in an unmarked grave. The cycling between the two poles of primitivism and modernism lives on in part because Finley's own intellectual progression accepted some aspects of the modernist argument. Moses Finley, it appears, stood out among ancient historians of his generation, and most since, by stating that, value-free and objective research was an impossibility. This is a powerful ideology at the elite universities. Unfortunately, personal opinions, speculation and counter-arguments have until now formed the basis for leading academic debate on the ancient economy. For further discussion, see part two of this talk. Can Oxbridge scholars explain the Roman economy? For more detailed information, see my books. Rome and the Distant East, 2010. The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean, 2014. And the Roman Empire and the Silk Roots, 2016. Follow the link below. Thank you.